what if a second Trump presidency is actually a good thing for Ukraine? Now, hear me out, because I know that kind of flies in the face of most conventional arguments at this point. But if the rumors about this Trump peace proposal are true, this is essentially a plan for Ukraine to win the war. Now, I feel like this is worth getting into because we've had a pretty tumultuous week, all things considered, here in U.S. domestic politics. Uh, about a week ago, former President Trump narrowly avoided an assassination attempt. And then just yesterday, current President Joe Biden decided to step out of the 2024 race. So I think it's pretty safe to say at this point that Trump has at least a 50-50 chance of becoming our next president. And there's a lot of people making very valid arguments that he's currently the front runner. So if you're following something like the war in Ukraine or the war in Gaza or any other conflicts around the world, like most of you are, I think it's worth diving into what a Trump presidency might mean for Ukraine in the short term. And one of the areas we're going to look at here is this peace proposal, because he's been talking for a long time now about how when he comes into office, he'll be able to end the war very quickly. We haven't really had any idea what that could mean. We've got a little bit of insight, but i do say, you have to take this with a grain of salt. It's coming from former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson in an interview talking about what he thinks Trump's plan might be. So this is not coming from the Trump campaign. It's not coming from Trump itself. It's second, third-hand sources at best talking about what could be on the table. However, I do think it's worth addressing because it's the closest we've heard about any possible Trump plan as it comes to you, when, it relate, when it comes to Ukraine at all. So Boris Johnson said, quote, I believe that Trump can end it. On the right terms for Ukraine in the West, I stress that I cannot be sure exactly what he would do if elected, but this is what he could do. Johnson believes that the first step is to strengthen the hand of the West and to strengthen Ukraine, essentially try to get Ukraine in a better position to negotiate and enter the war. He believes that U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump could simply do what comes naturally to him, cut through the red tape and delays, grant the Ukrainians the necessary authorizations, and then when, Tr when Putin is pushed back again, he could propose a deal. So again, a lot of the times we've heard peace negotiations, ceasefires brought up in the war in Ukraine, there, there's often the look that it's going to be on Putin's terms and essentially going to cede territory to Russia. What they're arguing here is, is just the opposite. Take the time to really increase lethal support to Ukraine, allow them to strike wherever they want inside of Russia to turn the tide of the war, maybe more, right? They don't say this, but reading between the lines, maybe it means more NATO assistance in some way, shape, or form to get Putin on his back foot to have to negotiate from a position of weakness rather than a position of power. Johnson emphasized that Kremlin ruler Vladimir Putin will have to pull back to at least the pre-invasion borders of 2022 to prevent future conflict and uncertainty. The rest of Ukraine would have would, uh, would have to be recognized as a free country with the right to determine its own future, including potential membership in the European Union and NATO, and should be welcome to join as soon as possible. I'm going to pull up uh, the deep state map here to give you an idea. The date is actually off a little bit on this for a later part in the video. It's a month old. But to give you an idea of what they're talking about when they say pre-2022 borders, looking at this map, the green areas are areas liberated by Ukrainian forces, currently occupied by Ukrainian forces. Um... So that is Ukraine. When they're talking about pre-2022 borders, it's essentially these light red areas or orange areas. Those would be areas, according to this uh, peace proposal that's you know, rumored out there, those would be moved back to Ukrainian control, whereas these kind of light purple or, or reddish areas here, you have Mariupol in the south and a portion of the Donbass, Luhansk, and Donetsk in the east, those were taken by Russian forces in 2014. So according to this, what Johnson is putting out, Crimea and Luhansk and Donetsk, portions of Luhansk and Donetsk would remain in Russian control. Uh, Johnson stressed that the Ukrainians will have more than a million people with weapons, are already well accustomed to working with NATO equipment, and are the most effective anti-Russian force in the world. When the war is over, there is no reason, quote, why Ukrainian forces should not backfill some of the 70,000 U.S. troops still in Europe. According to Johnson, this would enable Trump to save money, bring U.S. troops home, and push Europeans to take greater responsibility for their own defense, which is one of Trump's key objectives. So when looking at all of this, you have to think of it from that sense. What is Trump and what is the United States going to get out of this to push the war to a conclusion on favorable terms for Ukraine? And the argument that Johnson is bringing up here is it could allow uh, Trump to push the Ukrainians then to take a larger role in European security, in NATO security, in, in, in preventing Russia from doing this in the future, and possibly even pulling some U.S. troops out of Europe. 
there's no way that's going to be a one for one. Um, it's not just infantry or, or armor, or artillery that we have all across Europe. There's a lot of kind of closely integrated capabilities with our NATO partners. So there's no way that you're going to see a complete one to one swap between Ukraine and and U.S. troops. But it's an idea again being floated here. Johnson also suggested that Russian leader Vladimir Putin could claim that the, quote, special military operation was successful and that he had achieved the denazification of Ukraine. Additionally, special protection measures might be implemented for Russian speakers. Putin could announce the denazification of Ukraine whenever he wants because it wasn't really it's it's never really been a focus of this war. This is one of those things where whenever he wants, he can just say that's complete mission accomplished and move on. So, sure, if, if they want that on the table as saying that it's been achieved, they could do that, a Russian victory. Uh, and then, actually, this does speak to a lot of the Russian goals and something Putin has stressed from the early days in the war, some sort of protection measures for Russian speakers in eastern portion of Ukraine. I imagine Ukraine would be uh, pretty keen on doing that if it meant the return of a bunch of that territory to Ukrainian control, moving into the European Union and moving into NATO. By all measures, that is a Ukrainian victory. So, again... While there's been a lot of talk about Trump taking office being the end for Ukraine or aid being shut off, and I think we'll work on a video later talking about that, my gut says there's really not going to be much change at all. Uh, but what they're hinting at here is it could actually be a positive for Ukraine with Trump pushing to end the war on favorable terms for Ukraine as they move into NATO and the European Union. Again, to kind of wrap up that piece there, that's all speculation. Grain of salt. Be very, very careful with how you interpret that. I just felt like it was worth mentioning an idea that could be out there for a future U.S. president. Now, turning to the battlefield, we'll look at some updates here. Uh, I'm actually working on a video that should come out this week or next week, diving into some thoughts on who's winning. Uh, who's winning the war in Ukraine? Who's winning the war in Gaza? Because it's complicated. And I know we, a lot of us, really just want to have a scoreboard, right? You can look at the scoreboard and see the clear side is winning in, in some way, shape, or form. That's just not how war plays out. It's complicated in a lot of ways. Uh, and I thought it was worth diving into some of those aspects here. Again, more of a deep dive coming in a couple days. That what we have seen in recent days is kind of an in recent weeks, really, is an increase in drone and missile strikes taking place by both sides. So we've got a recent video of a Ukrainian UAV attack, UAV attack on an oil depot in Tuops. Uh, there was also a Ukrainian video showing, or not, we didn't see the actual strike, just saw the burning, the aftermath of an airfield that was hit in Rostov, kind of the southern portion of Russia. Uh, and then Russia has been putting out footage, constant footage, of deep strikes inside of Ukrainian territory. We've seen them targeting uh, multiple bridges in recent weeks. And then just a couple days ago, a video where they said they targeted a rail hub carrying equipment for the Ukrainian 41st Mechanized Brigade, saying that they destroyed dozens of Western supplied equipment in this one strike on the rail hub. A couple thoughts with all of this. Um, we are seeing more strikes inside of Russian territory carried out by uh, Ukraine. A couple of reasons for that is likely an increase in munitions, uh, more ATACMs like that, and then more long-range drones that Ukraine has been able to develop uh, domestically for the most part. There's also likely been some sort of reduction in Russian air defense capabilities, whether that is the overall capabilities of the systems or the number of systems, as some have been destroyed across the front. Either way, it does look like more Ukrainian munitions are getting through. Conversely, we are seeing a lot more strikes inside of Ukrainian territory being carried out with lancets or iskanders. You know, the lancets are relatively short-range munitions, so we're seeing the, the drone footage from that. But iskander missiles, artillery, things like that, we're still seeing those pop up every single day inside of Ukrainian territory. And the big takeaway there is it's largely due to the fact that Russia is able to maintain drones overhead inside of Ukrainian airspace for long periods of time. That is new new-ish in the last couple months, and it points to or suggests that Ukraine has a shortage in short-range air defense systems. So when you see some of these things being recorded and, and presented to the internet, I wouldn't take that to mean that these strikes are new, more just that for somewhat for the first time in a long time in this war, we're seeing regular updated Russian footage of successful strikes deep behind the front. Again, one of the, the focuses coming out of the NATO summit just a couple weeks ago was more air defense assets for Ukraine. So maybe that'll be shipped into country soon and we'll start to see more of those Russian drones shot down. But either way, last couple weeks, significant uptick in uh, deep strikes, both inside of Russian territory and inside of Ukrainian territory. Then turning over to a look at the map here, again, deep state map, there's one area of focus I want to dive into when looking at Russian offensives on the ground. And again, to kind of bring it back to the, the video coming out soon about who's winning, 
one of the things that that Russian supporters often point to as to why they're winning is the territory changing hands in favor of Russia. And there's no doubt about that. Russia has taken more territory uh, really since last summer over the course of the last year. It's pretty much been continuous Russian gains compared with very little territory taken by Ukraine. So if we're just looking at territorial control inside the country, that is an aspect of this war that Russia is winning. You then get into the argument of uh, the cost of taking that territory and how long it's taking and the tactical significance and all that. But nonetheless, Russia has for months now been advancing in multiple areas of the front. One of those that I want to key in on here is in the Toretsk direction. So the map here is actually uh, from a month ago. And I'm going to play this on Deep State. They have this feature where you can you can watch it play out for a period of time. I'm going to play this so you can see how the battlefield has changed in this general area right here. So Turetsk right in the middle of the screen, Bakhmut to the north, Avdivka to the south. Of course, Bakhmut was heavy, heavy battles a little over a year ago. Avdivka a few months ago fell to Russian forces. This is notable. Turetsk is notable because this area here, uh, the purple, this area is where Ukraine had been able to build up defenses since 2014. So at times, you're talking about 10 years of fortifications. When those fall, you, you cannot expect the lines, the secondary or third lines behind that to be as robust. It's it's one of the arguments as to why in Avdivka right here, when those lines fell, Russia was able to move relatively rapidly uh, further north and west. So that is a concern when looking at this Turetsk area. I'm going to zoom out a little bit to give you an idea here. And we're going to go ahead and hit play. You'll see how you know there's been a handful of areas that Russia has advanced, but really we are seeing still more movement west of Avdivka. But you're going to start to see a pocket form just south of Turetsk, and it risks right now how the Ukrainian forces are arrayed, potentially cutting off some elements there and facing a similar issue to what we saw in other areas of the front where Ukraine stays and fights for an extended period of time, inflicts as many casualties as they can on the Russian attackers, and then at some point eventually are forced to withdraw so as to not be encircled and cut off. So you can see here, this is just the first three weeks of, uh, well, we're coming up here on the, on the 22nd. So we're on the 20th. You can see pretty quickly how this pocket right here, south of Turetsk, and now we're up to date. The 21st is the most recent. We're recording this on the 22nd. So you can see how there's some concern that Ukrainian forces in this pocket right here are at risk of being cut off. And with the water features to the rear, there's only so many ways they're going to be able to exit this battlefield. So keep an eye on this. Um, all indications based off of how the front has played out in recent months is that Ukraine is likely to withdraw from this area uh, and, and have to cede this territory to Russian forces. Now, zooming back out, uh, again, talking about the things that each side can kind of view as a victory or a success so far in this war. If we head down to the Black Sea, which I guess it actually would have been worthwhile to keep the map up here for a second. It's another area that I feel like we just talk about a lot, and, and maybe sometimes it helps to get an idea of where that is. So you've got Ukraine right here in the middle of the map, Russia uh, to the east, the Black Sea here to the south. Right, And the Battle of the Black Sea is something that's raged from the opening days of this war. Uh, and there was a statement put out this past week saying that the last patrol ship of the Russian Black Sea fleet is leaving Crimea right now. This is a Ukrainian spokesperson who said, remember this day. And you know, it's worth mentioning that in March, so just a couple months ago, the UK Ministry of Defense declared that the Russian Black Sea fleet was functionally inactive. It said that Ukraine is slowly but steadily gaining the upper hand in the Black Sea, saying that Russia has lost control of that body of water. The Atlantic Council put out an article talking about all this when they said when the full-scale invasion began, the Russian Black Sea Fleet had 74 warships, most of which were based at ports in Russian-occupied Crimea. Pull this map back up here to give you an idea of that area. In a little over two years, Ukraine managed to sink or damage about one-third of these ships. The Russian Navy's readiness to retreat from the supposedly sacred home ports in Crimea have made a uh, have made a mockery of Moscow's so-called red lines and exposed the emptiness of Putin's nuclear threats. Nevertheless, Kiev's international allies remain reluctant to draw the obvious conclusions. Instead, Western support for Ukraine continues to be defined by self-defeating fears of escalation. So they do kind of take this Black Sea piece and move it into the U.S. needs to do more or the West needs to do more. They say the West's fear of escalation is Putin's most effective weapon. It allows him to limit the military aid reaching Kyiv while also preventing Ukraine from striking back against Russia. This is slowly but surely setting the stage for inevitable Russian victory in a long war of attrition. 
Western leaders claim to be motivated by a desire to avoid provoking a wider war, but that is exactly what will happen if they continue to pursue misguided policies of escalation management and fail to stop Putin in Ukraine. So notable here that, you know, the Black Sea, home to the Black Sea fleet, a major aspect of the Russian Navy and their military power, uh, has largely left the area. They're not all gone, and I think, you know, we're not going to get the exact details of that, but the way I read it was certain ships had left and kind of relocated to the Sea of Azov. Pull this back up here. Sea of Azov is just here, uh, kind of northeast of the Black Sea, and supposedly Russian ships feel safer there, able to operate uh, at less risk, probably due to the the limitations that unmanned surface vessels would have reaching this area because the whole shoreline is controlled by Russian forces. Whereas anything in Crimea can be launched from like, you know, Odessa, Kherson with those USVs coming around and striking Russian vessels. But either way, that's pretty significant, right? Ukraine at this point, a country without a Navy, essentially able to repel uh, one of the largest and most powerful navies in the world from a body of water uh, along their border. That's, that's significant. Now, moving back to uh, an interesting story here on the battlefield, we hear a lot about Russia's use of prisoners throughout this war. Not a lot about Ukraine doing the same, but they, they apparently have started uh, trying to incorporate some convict units into the forces. Uh, this one under the 47th Mechanized Brigade called, and I'm going to mispronounce this, I know, uh, Shkval, S-H-K-V-A-L. They say that's the name given to a new battalion, which consists of former prisoners and experienced military officers. They say the unit cons consists of citizens who served their sentences in prison and is formed of volunteers who have decided to defend their country. In a statement, the 47th Brigade said, Our recruiting department took a very reasonable approach to the selection process, and that's why every former prisoner was interviewed. Everyone has the right to make a mistake and at the same time get a second chance. They added that these prison recruits, uh, there is some degree of amnesty involved here. I wasn't able to find the details on that. Uh, but they said for two months, the recruits were trained by the brigade's best instructors who did their best to share all of their combat experience. And we have seen footage in recent days of these prisoner units, if you will, uh, using Bradley, Bradley fighting vehicles, American Bradley fighting vehicles to uh, engage and destroy Russian forces. So it looks like a portion of what Ukraine is doing is similar to what we saw in Russia. A lot of the Storm Z type units in Russia were being used more as light infantry assault troops, sometimes being viewed as disposable infantry. It looks like Ukraine has tapped into their prison system as well in recent months to try to build up just the raw numbers of their forces. But rather than assault infantry, disposable troops, they're putting some of these troops through months of training and then handing them Bradleys, some of the most advanced fighting vehicles they have uh, all along the front, some of the most... Uh, survivable vehicles all along the front. It's kind of the polar opposite of, of disposable infantry. But that's it. That's all I got for now. Uh, if interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack titled Between the Lines. It's linked in the description below. Cover a variety of subjects from Ukraine, Russia, China, uh, all across the Middle East and Asia. I think it's pretty interesting. Of course, linked down below if you want to check that out. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.